Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Adams Simmons, Executive Editor for History and Culture at National Geographic. I am thrilled that we will have a conversation this afternoon with historian Martha Jones and writer Michelle Duster about the role of African American women uh, in the suffrage movement. While we know that um, August 2020 is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, we also know um, that suffrage wasn't guaranteed for all women even after the vote happened. And so we will hear today from uh, Martha and Michelle uh, about the work that they've been doing to chronicle the experiences of Black women. So Martha, uh, you are a professor at um, John Hopkins University. Feel free to um, tell the audience more about what you do, but I'd also like you to set the stage for us of the environment um, for women, Black and white women, both um, before the Civil War and afterwards as it relates to suffrage. Well, um, thank you so much, Deborah, um, and thanks to National Geographic. Um, thanks also to uh, the Women of Impact group for um, hosting me. It's an honor to be here, especially, uh, especially with Michelle Duster. So thank you so much. Um, you've asked a huge question. Um, and as you know, I've just finished a book um, called Vanguard that looks at 200 years of um, African-American women's politics with a focus on the quest for voting rights. Um, it's a story that um, for American women um, certainly has one beginning in the early decades of the 19th century as um, women across the United States, uh, the relatively new United States, are beginning to ask questions about um, their status, their standing, their, um, their um, vexed positions in American politics. Um, the early 19th century is an era um, where um, American political leaders don't apologize for um, uh, using both um, what today we call racism and um, what today we call sexism as um, arbiters of political rights. So the first part of the story really is about the um, raising of American women's consciousness. Um, some do that within anti-slavery societies, others do that within church organizations, still others in literary societies, um, but there is a kind of um, political awakening for American women um, that will, um, if you will, really take hold in the years after the American Civil War when the U.S. Constitution is being revised, when millions of former slaves are being incorporated into the nation as citizens. It is a revolution that we call Reconstruction, and American women are very much a part of that. Um, now very pointedly asking um, what kinds of new rights they should enjoy um, in that period. Um, it is also a vexed time when old allies out of the anti-slavery movement in particular um, have different ideas about who should be next when it comes to voting rights. Um, African-American men, educated, which is sort of code for uh, white women, or, um, or should there be universal suffrage, um, is the question of the 1860s. And this will lead to a, a sort of splintering um, of American women and their allies that will take us into the 20th century, the founding of um, two women's suffrage associations, and by the end of the century, the founding of the National Association of Colored Women, um, which for me is as is the equivalent of African-American women's um, uh, suffrage associations, a body that is organized around anti-lynching, but also around women's suffrage and many other civil rights concerns that African-Americans bring to the table. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. And we, we know that um, uh, Frances Allen uh, Watkins Harper said that uh, we're all bound up together and that for black women, um, uh, their, their, their rights as, as African Americans and their rights as women could not be disentangled. Uh, Michelle Duster, you are the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells and she really was the epitome of fighting for both those causes. Can you talk about, um, talk about her work? <laughs> 
Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> um, well, as Martha said, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is really an honor to participate um, with National Geographic and Women of Impact, and obviously to um, have a conversation with Martha Jones. Um, like that's also <laughs> kind of a big question. Um, my great grandmother was really um, focused on, oh, overall, I think she was focused on civil rights and um, equality. So voting fit into that, the right, gaining the right to vote fit into what her overarching um, goal was. And so she's most well known for the um, journalism work that she did regarding um, exposing the, the, the actual horrors and reality of lynching. Um, but I think just basically, basically um, based on her own life experiences, she realized that um, laws had to be changed and policies had to be implemented in order for um, African Americans in general and African American women in specific to actually um, have greater chance of equality. And so she looked at voting as a tool to um, have influence over the people who have imp input and influence into who uh, created the laws. Martha, can you talk about the um, tension between black women and white women um, at this time? And really how that has played out sort of historically, but in particular, can you talk about the sort of splinter and, and why it occurred? You addressed some of that um, in the intro that you gave us, but I think there's a um, limited understanding of just how complicated those relationships were. So African-American women um, organize um, by way of a political philosophy, as I suggested, that in, decries both racism and sexism. Um, but along the road to the 19th Amendment, they encounter um, suffragists, white suffragists, um, frankly, too many of whom um, continue to um, condone, um, use strategically, and otherwise um, are complicit with anti-Black racism within um, the various facets of the suffrage movement. This means that the suffrage associations that we most frequently associate with the road to the 19th Amendment are never really hospitable or um, comfortable um, places for African-American women to organize. Um, and it's important to say Black women don't spend all their time trying to um, if you will, ingratiate themselves into those associations and instead build their own political movement by way of organizations like the NAACP, like the National Association of Colored Women, um, and more. Um, when we talk about the suffrage movement, we really, in my view, have to talk about the suffrage movements uh, because African American women um, over time will create their own. Michelle, can you um, can you talk to us a little bit about the um, the nineteen thirteen either of you really the nineteen thirteen march and why um, the suffrage march was significant? Um, I mean, I can give my perspective, and I'm sure uh, Martha can add more details. But um, as a great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells, who was, who participated in the march. Um, in 1913, the state of Illinois, which is where my great grandmother was living, um, gave women partial suffrage, which which was um, they had the right to vote for presidential in presidential elections and municipal elections. For whatever reason, they weren't able to vote in statewide elections, um, and so around that same time. Um, I mean, my, my great grandmother writes in her book about how she had been involved in um, suffrage organizations in the state of Illinois, um, which led up to that 1913 um, partial suffrage. But the the organizations that she was um, affiliated with were predominantly white, and so after the 19, the um, 
the partial suffrage was, was passed in Illinois, she decided to form a, an all black suffrage organization. And she talks about how black women, and that this is what she said, um, that black women were sort of um, not super involved in the suffrage um, efforts and I guess we're a little bit cynical about the idea of, you know, wh how this could actually lead to empowerment. And so um, she went to the march in Washington, the suffrage march, as the first thing that she did as uh, representing the Alpha Suffrage Club, because it was about a month or so from the time she formed it until the march happened. And so she went, as far as I know, she was the only African-American woman who went with the Illinois delegation, which was all white, but she was considered a peer in Illinois. And they had planned to march together, but then the black women were asked, not just her, but all black women were asked to march in the back of the parade. And she had a real problem with that since she had been working with white women all along in Illinois. So she ultimately refused and then, and then managed to march with the Illinois delegation anyway. <laughs> and that's just a, such an important metaphor for what that schism uh, was like. Uh, um, Martha, can you talk to us a little bit about the sort of protest movement of the um, suffrage era? Uh, you know, there were the parades, there also were the silent sentinels who, um, you know, were abused during their, their protest work. Talk about that for members of of this um, Women of Impact group who may not know that much about them. So we're, um, we're focused here um, largely on the work led by Alice Paul, who um, goes on to lead the National Women's Party in the road to the 19th Amendment. But Paul had been, um, if you will, had come of age um, in Britain um, and among suffrage activists there. Um, she was, um, she was a traitor in a confrontational um, and even radical style of politics um, that included the kind of political theater of the 1913 March, 5,000 plus women upstaging the president's inaugural parade, which is scheduled for the next day. It's really remarkable. Um, and then as you allude to uh, Deborah, in 1917 and 18, Alice Paul will um, with her comrades picket the White House um, looking to pressure, shame, embarrass um, Woodrow Wilson and his administration into supporting a federal amendment for women's suffrage. Um, that will lead to civil dis disobedience, as we sometimes say, that will lead to um, white women's suffragists being arrested and detained as political prisoners, um, albeit briefly. Um, so Alice Paul um, works, if you will, up front while other uh, white suffragists like Carrie Chapman Catt are working behind the scenes, uh, working the back rooms of Washington, working the dinner parties of Washington, um, looking also to um, change the president's mind on this question. Um, and they are, as we know, ultimately successful, um, this uh, two-pronged approach um, that will lead to Wilson's endorsement of a federal amendment and finally, what becomes the 19th Amendment coming out of Congress. Now, can you talk about some of the pressure that Wilson was under? Uh, it's my understanding that even some of his own family members, the women in his own family, um, sort of pushed him to reconsider some earlier positions. I mean, the, tr the pressures are tremendous um, by this period, and they are only exacerbated by the entry of the United States into the First World War. Um, the war effort, um, you would think, um, would lead to a kind of consolidation or unification of the nation around politics. Um, but Alice Paul um, is um, not only intent on continuing to keep the pressure on the president while other suffragists are prepared to stand back during the war, um, she is prepared in a, to go ahead and even liken um, Wilson and his refusal to support um, the vote for women. She will liken that to um, fascism abroad and, um, and really um, up the political stakes for the president. If I can say one more thing that 
Um, because I want to keep African American women in this conversation, it's important to note that yes, there are black women who um, ally themselves with um, Alice Paul, um, at least episodically. We've heard the, ex the important example of Ida B. Wells. Um, also Mary Church Terrell, who as best we know is the only African American woman to participate in those pickets in Washington in front of the White House. Um, there are some black women who join with Paul, um, but many more black women are facing um, far too many burdens politically in this moment. Anti-lynching is still a critical question. African Americans, how on earth will they get to the polls ever if they continue to be um, ground down by the scourge of intimidation and by lynchings violence. Um, so black women are continuing the work of anti-lynching. Um, by the time we get to the 19 teens, there's an effort afoot in Congress to repeal the 15th Amendment, which in 1870 had been the constitutional amendment that prohibited states from using race. Well, that becomes part of the political um, game that surrounds the 19th Amendment. So African American women, yes, are um, concerned about this campaign um, and many of them supportive of it, but are also having to confront a panoply of political issues, um, all of which go to the heart and soul of them, their own lives and of their communities. And we know that many of those issues persist today, because we're going to, in a few moments, shift to um, talking about where we are now, I just want the um, participants in the conversation, if you have questions, uh, please um, put them forward and the um, organizers of the panel will see that um, they get to us and we can pose those questions to our uh, panelists. Um, so much of, of what has happened historically is now bubbling up as we are on the um, on the one hand, on the heels of waiting to see who a vice presidential uh, running mate might be, you know, might it be a, a woman who, um, this would really paint a very different picture than that picture in the U.S. 100 years ago, particularly if it's a black woman, uh, but the country is also, you know, living through a pandemic, um, and important for this conversation, significant rollbacks to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we know that um, 1920 didn't really guarantee anyone rights. 1965 shored up those rights. And then in 2013, uh, some of those rights uh, were taken away. Uh, Martha, can you give us a sense of, of what happened in 2013 and why um, we're feeling the impact of that today? 2013 in the US Supreme Court case of Shelby versus Holder um, declares that critical provisions, what are called the pre-clearance provisions of the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 are unconstitutional. These were requirements that um, led those states who had historically disenfranchised voters to pre-clear, to get federal approval before imposing restrictions or restraints or rules on voting rights. That requirement was gutted by the US Supreme Court. And so today we see a resurgence, I would say, of state level laws and policies, not unlike those that were in place in 1920 that kept black women from the polls 100 years ago. Today we have state level laws, voter ID requirements, purging of voter rolls, um, the shuttering of polling places, um, which have returned us to um, a new era of voter suppression. You're right to point out, of course, that is further exacerbated, not only for black women, but for all Americans, um, when our state leaders uh, appear to be fumbling on the question of how to get us safely and securely to the polls in November. And so, Michelle, you have been uh, referred to as a generational activist. I don't know if you would necessarily describe yourself in that way, but can you talk about some of the work that you're doing to uh, draw attention to voting issues and others? Well, um, I mean, what I'm focusing on mostly, because there's, there's so many issues um, to focus on and I think just for sanity's sake, you know, it's kind of good to focus on a few 
Um, and so what I've really been working on is creating uh, public history projects that uh, recognize um, the contributions of, my goal is to recognize the contributions of African American women overall. Um, but since I can't do everything at one time, I decided to start with my great grandmother, um, you know, not just because I'm related to her, but because she was, a, you know, a really um, pivotal figure in our country's history. And this started with, um, there was a housing community in Chicago that was named after her called the Ida B. Wells Homes, which were a very significant um, housing community located on the south side of Chicago, not far from where she actually lived. And it um, stood in Chicago for over 60 years. So it was a very um, uh, well-known location and it kept her name in the public space. And it started to be torn down in 2002. And so I felt strongly that she was a woman, not a building. And so she, even if the buildings are gone, she, the woman, still needs to be recognized. So I've been working on getting a monument created um, on the land where the homes once stood. Um, I was involved in getting a major street renamed in Chicago after her called Ida B. Wells Drive. Um, I've gotten a couple of historical markers. And now I'm working with some women to um, get some some recognition for um, Illinois suffragists, of which she was one of them. But um, the first project that we're working on is to have a mural created that will recognize many of the suffrage leaders for, from our state. And I ultimately would love to have a monument created for Illinois suffragists. So my um, focus has been to create a little bit more equity in public spaces because the representation of African American women in monumental and statue form, as well as all other, you know, street names, building names, school names, all the other ways you can honor people, we are greatly misunderrepresented, um, are underrepresented. Um, only probably less than three percent um, are, you know focus on African-American women, almost some, almost 1% when it comes to national monuments. And African-Americans make up 13% of our population, so black women make up 6%. So at the very least, we could have 5%. Um, so just to give really short um, example, in Chicago, there are about 50 statues and, of life, of real people. and. The first one to a black woman was created in 2018 to Gwendolyn Brooks. And so, and I'm creating a monument, which is not a statue, and it'll be the first in Chicago um, to honor a black woman. And then in New York City, for example, there are 200 statues um, and only five represent women, period. And I think, there, well, there's an effort to create a couple um, I think it's called She Built Me NYC effort to create, I think, three statues to black women. So here we are in 2020, and we're, built, we're still at the first. <laughs> I think it matters, to, uh, representation matters. I was gonna ask this whole series of questions about, um, about monuments and about learning. Um, particularly since there were so few examples for you to draw from, um, where did you get your inspiration and what was the process like, both getting a street named as well as um, a, a monument uh, approved, installed? Well, the monument is going to be installed um, this fall if everything goes right. Um, the, we started, we meaning I'm on a committee, um, we started working together in 2008. Um, so this has been much more of a marathon than I ever anticipated. I, I literally never imagined it would take 12 years. Um, so the process has been, um, this, this project I think is unique because it is going to be on the land where something else was. Um, and and there's a, there was a displacement that took place of an entire community. Um, mm -hmm. 
and that's different than I think some other you know projects that might just be in a park or something. But you're dealing with the annihilation of, a, of an entire community that um, was vibrant, um, and some people want to think about it in their whatever way they want to. But the bottom line is people lost their homes and their community, and so we had to work with the community. Um, there were there were a lot of emotions. Um, that are probably unique to some other situations. And so um, this process has been working with a group of people who are involved in sort of, quote, revitalizing the commu community or redeveloping it, um, but also some community leaders as well as politicians. So there are a lot of players um, involved in this process. Um, and so in that way, I really do think it's unique compared to some other projects that I've heard about. Um, do you think it could be a model for replacement of so many of these other monuments that are coming down around the country? Um, I think, I think that there just needs to be a um, stronger conversation about who and what we celebrate in our country. Um, and I personally think that el eliminating everything that we might find offensive um, could potentially, you know, lead to amnesia <laughs> of what our country has been. I think we, we, ne we need to recognize that our country has for the past hundred and something years, um, celebrated, you know, um, mass murderers, <laughs> racist, um, slaveholders, slave, um, um, traders. I mean, <clears throat> so if we erase all of that, then there could be, you know, I'll just say a hundred years from now, then there could be a denial that this ever happened. So I think we need to be reminded of that, but I think that we need to, um, have equal or more representation of people who fought for um, equality and justice. Um, so I don't think erasing the bad history gets rid of it. Right. We, we need to acknowledge this happened too. Okay, we um, have a question from our Facebook group for, um, for I guess for both of you. Would black suffragists consider voting an obligation? In my view, uh, black suffragists consider um, voting um, first and foremost um, a sign of full citizenship. There's no question that there's a symbolic value to voting. And on the other hand, there is the, um, the very practical sense that voting is a tactic, right? It's one tactic by which black Americans, men and women might be able to win political power and resources, um, and both things are true, right? The symbolic value of the vote, but also the very pragmatic um, insight, which is that the way in which political power in the United States is meted out in part is every, uh, every year on um, election day. Okay, another question. Um, did Barry Church Terrell or W.E.B. Du Bois or others compare the National Women's Party's own hypocrisy about voting rights to the hypocrisy of which they accuse President Wilson. So the questioner is essentially saying, are, are, you know, were the white women's organizations guilty of the same thing they accuse Wilson of? I can try, Michelle. I don't know. <laughs> weigh in. I, I mean, because, you know, Ida Wells and Mary Church Terrell are interesting. Um, figures in this story because um, they do not abandon their relationships with white suffragists wholly, even as they are strained, even as they are tried um, by racism. Um, and so in this way, um, yes, there are moments when, um, you know, outright denunciation of um, policies and views um, that are part of the suffrage movement are in order. Um, but what's remarkable, I think, about some of these Black suffragists is that racism is the order of the day. They know that. 
Um, and their question is how to use every strategy available to them um, to get to goal, which in includes the goal of the full enfranchisement of black women and men. Um, and in some days that means showing up at a parade where you're not welcome. Um, it means um, attending a suffrage association meeting um, where many people um, don't welcome you. Um, and I think both Ida Wells and um, Mary Church Terrell really um, characterize that kind of um, very nuanced, tough, nuanced leadership. Um, and nothing less is demanded of Black women um, in the era of Jim Crow, nothing less. And can both of you speak to the importance of Black women's organizations in um, and creating a support system and a network to do the work that they were engaged in? Well, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, Black women had been involved in um, club movements for several decades. Um, and I mean, the, the bottom line is that they, they did not have the right to vote. Um, and so their sense of empowerment or, or their, the power that they did have came from um, collective organizing within these clubs. Um, and so, and a lot of the clubs um, were organized, and it, I mean, I think this is true even today, um, were sort of, were organized within the church structure. Um, and, and still today in 2020, that's where a lot of black women um, have a sense of pow empowerment um, so if you are working as a collective group, you know, and then as a group, you go to some uh, power structure, some power figure and say, you know, we as a community, we as an organized group are making this demand or request. There is a sense of empowerment, even if you don't have the vote. I mean, we can see that today, even with just say some of the young people who are too young to vote right now, but they're still making their voices heard and they're still making um, some kind of an impact because they have a collective voice. Um, one of the things I wanted to say to kind of add to what Martha said about uh, black women and, and dealing with white suffragists or, um, is that I say my great grandmother and I'm sure other women did not look at all white women as one, you know, one thing. I mean, they were just as diverse as, as we are. And I mean, you know, as I mentioned, my great grandmother worked with white women in Illinois um, in suffrage organizations. So there were white allies, as well as there were white women who were opposed to or, you know, um, believed in segregation. And so it wasn't that cut and dry, um, a, a very uh, rigid color line. Um, and I think that's important, you know, in all fairness to recognize as well. Okay, um, Martha, can you talk about the book that you have just written? Thank you for that. Um, Vanguard, uh, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote and Insisted on Equality for All, looks at 200 years of African-American women's um, political thought and political activism, the road to the 19th Amendment, and then beyond that to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and comes right up to our own time. Um, I wrote the book in part because I wanted people to understand where figures like Kamala Harris, Val Demings, Stacey Abrams, and others, the political tradition out of which Black women come in the United States. They, these are not women who landed from someplace else in 2020 um, at all, in fact, um, that they themselves will tell you that they reach back to a Shirley Chisholm or a Barbara Jordan in the 1970s or an Ida Wells or a Mary Church Terrell at the beginning of the 20th century or back even to the 19th century, a Sojourner Truth or a Harriet Tubman. So I wanted to write a history that helped us appreciate um, the long tradition of black women's politics, the long struggle for black women for not only voting rights, but for little political power so that we could better um, read the political landscape in our own time. Um, so thank you. It'll be out um, September 8th, but you can pre-order. So please do. Thank you. <laughs> 
I'll point out that you did write a story um, that um, published on nationalgeographic.com last week, and there is a link to the book in that story. So we encourage people to read the story and click on the link. I'd also like to mention the um, story that we did in the August issue of National Geographic Magazine. Uh, Michelle Duster is um, featured in the story and uh, Martha Jones is quoted in the story. Um, before we get off this call, I might actually be able to, um, to call that up, but I don't want to do anything that um, will destabilize an already shaky uh, Wi-Fi connection. So uh, we will keep going. You mentioned um, the names of several of the Black women who um, appear to be um, contenders to be the um, vice presidential running mate of Joe Biden. What do you think the significance is um, of this moment where you have, you know, several women of color being in a conversation, several black women in particular being in a conversation um, about being the vice president of the United States? You know, do you think that's a, a sign of progress or um, given the environment that we're in, is it political theater? What do you make of this moment? You know, if, this if, if, it you. Was one, if it was one Black woman, I might say it was window dressing or political theater. But there are at least six formidable, distinct Black women, um, all of whom in their own right um, are not only viable, but forceful contenders for the vice presidential slot and the, of the Democratic Party. Um, that is not everything. We've talked about voter suppression and the ways in which Black women are going to be kept from the polls this year, but it is also true, at least in my view, that what we are seeing is the fruits of the struggles that Black women have waged for political power, particularly since 1965 and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, but even beyond that, um, we're seeing the, the, the fruits of that. Black women who are, um, are ready to go um, and to lead this country, right, if they have the opportunity. Um, and for me, my sense is that there's no turning back from that, even as there are many other struggles to be waged before we say that black women have reached some sort of political parity in the United States. That just isn't yet true. I would like to add to that, um, because I think that what Martha said kind of addresses the candidates who are being considered, um, who are definitely well-deserving and um, qualified, probably overqualified compared to some people. Um, but I think, this is just my opinion, I think in addition to the women who are being considered and rightfully they should be, um, I think there's a recognition that black women in this country are a political force when it comes to voting as well. I mean, it's been well documented that Doug Jones in um, Alabama won because of black women um, being so entrenched and, and engaged in the political system that I think there's a recognition that black women are, um, are voters that need to be uh, satisfied to some extent. We, they, they need to address our concerns because we vote. We do vote. Now, people want to blame us for everything, you know, when stuff doesn't go the way they want it to, but statistically, we vote more. Um, and then we vote in certain ways. And so I think the Democratic Party is being strategic and not only um, recognizing and considering certain particular individuals who are qualified, but I think they're being strategic when it comes to engaging with the Black community, knowing that we um, have certain concerns that we want to have addressed, and we will vote for the people who will address those concerns. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Martha, can you speak to some of the issues that um, may keep people from the polls this year or the efforts that are underway to perhaps keep people from the polls? I mean, we have the whole situation with the post office. We have, um, we have voting rolls being um, 
uh, reviewed and names falling off. There's like a whole series of things that are happening. Do you think that's strategic um, and what needs to be done to address it? The lessons of the 19th Amendment, of the 19th Amendment um, are that indeed um, lawmakers will use um, rules written on their face neutrally, right? Nobody says I'm disenfranchising black people in the letter of the law. Nobody says I'm disenfranchising women, but they'll use their discretion to apply those laws in a way that disproportionately keep in our own time people of color, um, women away from the polls. Um, so here we are in an era of voter suppression um, exacerbated um, by a pandemic. Um, it is so reminiscent to me of the poll taxes, of the literacy tests, of the understanding tests, um, of the grandfather clauses that characterized the 19th Amendment era the lynching, the violence um, today, I think, is mirrored in a coronavirus that has disproportionately um, uh, visited and um, caused the, the illness and the death of both Black Americans and Latino Americans. Um, now people have to put their, take their lives in their hands once again in 2020 um, to get to the polls. The parallels um, are um, not only eerie, um, they should stop us on our tr tracks. The last thing I'll say is because we have no constitutionally guaranteed right to vote in this country. While the 15th and the 19th Amendment and other amendments went to, um, to an important degree limiting the kinds of things that states could do, um, the U.S. Constitution does not guarantee any of us the right to vote. The burden remains on us um, to insist, to be vigilant, um, to overcome the hurdles, oftentimes at great risk. That was true 100 years ago, and it looks like that will also be true in November. Um, I'm someone who's written um, about the need for a constitutional amendment that finally guarantees to every American the right to vote, but we don't live yet in that kind of political regime, and so we fight at so many turns, don't we, in order simply to cast ballots. Uh, another question from the uh, Women of Impact group. How do you think the tone of the Biden campaign might shift once he announces his running mate? Put another way, what does the campaign need from a VP pick? And I would add, if that pick is a, a Black woman in this sort of climate that we're living in, um, how do we think that impacts the campaign? Oh. Um. I, I just wanted to add one thing to the last point before I get into this, which is um, I think the other issue with when it comes to voting and potential voting suppression is just this, still this dynamic that everything is still run by the states instead of there being a national approach because there too mu there's too much um, variation among states and in, in the type of voting machines that people use, um, the, the hours that voting places are open, just all of those type of things are so, there's such a variety um, and disparity between states that it's, it's just not consistent. And I think that puts certain states at more of a disadvantage than others. Um, and when it comes to a uh, potential vice presidential pick and how that might impact the um, campaign, um, I, you know, like I said, I think that there has to be, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a, of a um, health crisis, we're in the middle of a financial crisis, and we're in the middle of a civic engagement, uh, civil unrest crisis. I mean, there's so many crises that are going on right now, and all of them disproportionately affect people of color. Um, and so, whomever ends up being the vice presidential pick and Joe Biden himself has to address these issues in order to have any kind of resonance with real, with people's real concerns and real life, what they call kitchen table um, kind of issues, you know. Otherwise, it's, it, it, will, it will be considered more of the same and I don't think that our country will do well with more of the same. Martha, did you want to add anything to that before we pivot? 
Sure, I, I guess I would add that I think um, one thing I'm sure Vice President Biden will get if he nominates an African-American woman um, is someone who comes out of, works through, and is committed to uh, a real humanitarian perspective on the future of this country. Black women have for 200 years spoken again and again through the perspective of humanity. It was one of the words I was really surprised to discover again and again in my research for Vanguard. And so it would be a mistake to expect that Black women come to public office, including high office like the vice presidency, um, to speak somehow to other Black women alone. Um, that the political tradition um, out of which these candidates come um, is one that really looks to yes, speak through the experience of Black women. And it's not one experience in the United right. States. To speak through those experiences and then to speak to the interests of all of humanity. Um, and I can't imagine um, a more timely, um, necessary, um, vital perspective to bring to American po politics than one that really um, opens arms um, to all of us um, takes the measure of this country, as Francis Ellen Watkins Harper put it um, a very long time ago, right? The weakest and the feeblest. Um, that is the measure of this country. And Black women have been working through that ethical and political view for a long time. I think it can only be an asset, not only to the Democratic Party, um, but an asset to the nation as a whole. And so we have a kind of a related question um, from someone who asks, what if anything in our current moment gives you hope? How can we continue inspiring the kind of active participation that will push us forward? I can tell you, I mean, I think maybe Martha feels the same way um, because I teach. <laughs> Um, my students give me hope because they're right out of high school. Um, so some of them are voting for the first time ever. And the level of engagement that I see um, and the, uh, lack, the amount of knowledge that they have about the different um, issues, they are way more politically savvy than I think people give you know, the young folks credit for. Um, and, and so I see another generation and a next generation becoming engaged and involved. And so that gives me a sense of hope that, um, you know, that the, the work isn't going to stop just because we have one generation that is leaving us. And I know it's very sad, obviously, to have some of the pioneers and some of the towering figures um, of our country who have fought for justice and equality to be leaving us. But I do feel that there is another generation that will be equally impactful in different ways. And they give me hope. Fantastic. Martha? Yes. Um, I'll say that it has been um, my ballast in these um, months, these unprecedented months and all of the challenges um, has been my students. Um, shout out to them and mm -hmm. I see them on Zoom and not much else these days, but there they are. And um, that has been really important. I, I, I'll, but I'll add that I, I do think that, um, you know, part of um, the way I would tell the story of African-American women's political power is about the story of generations. You, you noted Michelle Duster is a, a generational activist. I, I think, I don't know how Michelle feels about that moniker, but I do think there's something right to um, the ways in which uh, generations bequeath, they lead, they model, and they inspire us. And um, I am excited to um, hang around long enough to see the generation of um, black girls and young black women um, who are watching six African-American women vie 
for the vice presidential nomination, how our sense of possibility, um, our sense of who we are, where we belong, what we can do, what we must do. Um, I really believe that we are, who, whoever the nominee is, um, the names of these women, their faces, um, their work um, are inspiring next generations to do things that perhaps we can't even quite yet imagine. Um, and that gives me a great deal of hope because what I know is that um, while there is tremendous adversity in front of us, um, there's never been a generation of African-American women, certainly, um, who have sat down or turned around or given up, um, that we have nurtured one another through hardship and across generations. Um, so I'm excited um, for my granddaughters and my great-granddaughters, um, as I'm sure Ida Wells was for you, Michelle, in her own way. Um, understanding that that is the sort of work that we do, and that is the timeline, the tough timeline of the work that we do, um, that it continues out across generations. But I think there's something on the horizon that is really exciting. And, and speaking of passing the torch, M Michelle, I just have to ask this question because the Women of Impact group is a group of women of sort of different backgrounds. Um, talk about the, both the sort of joy and the responsibility or perhaps even the burden of being the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. Like how have you navigated that? Um, I think um, there, there are, you know, pros and cons to everything. And I think one of the challenges for me is that most people want to, I mean, rightfully so, focus on the pros, you know, because I get a lot of, oh, wow, that's so cool. You get your, you know, your great grandmother was one of my heroes and that must be so. And so it's just this sort of adulation for my great grandmother, which I appreciate and I'm happy that people are so enthusiastic about her um, and they know about a lot about her and they appreciate the work that she did and so the challenge becomes for me feeling there there are moments when I feel invisible um, because I feel that so much is about her that I'm I'm, I mean, people, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's one of the challenges, and it's something that I, I do, um, I'm purposeful about w within myself, of being clear within my own head of who I am, um, because it does kind of get lost in the mix sometimes, um, and so I have, you know, cha I've challenged myself to sort of define myself for myself, even if other people don't see it. Um, and I have even more recently been very purposeful about engaging in um, activities that just are for my own self-fulfillment to make myself happy that has nothing to do with being a great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells, because that's just me, I mean, it's just, maybe it's just me, but I just feel a need to, to be able to have my own um, definition of myself um, and so those are sort of the struggle I mean of course I'm you know honored and feel very fortunate that I am related to somebody who um, was so amazing and does still inspire people so much because you know my brothers and I tease each other like we could be related to you know mass murderer or something and like we'd have that as a you know legacy we'd have to overcome so if given a choice, you know, you want to have a positive, um, but it, it, carving out my own identity, I would say is the biggest sort of challenge. <laughs> Particularly since so much of your work is about carrying on the legacy. So do you feel like they often get blurred externally, even as you're working within yourself to try to create those lines? Um, I feel that it, I have had to um, be purposeful about making sure that people say my actual name um, and recognize my my Michelle actual um, credentials because my 
title is not great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. I mean, I am a professor, I am a writer, I have done a lot of other things. And so, you know, just within a um, professional space, I, I, I have to ask for that. And so that just kind of makes me realize that it's not top of mind for other people, but I have to advocate for myself. Um, and so it, maybe it's just a little more of a hurdle than it is for some other people who automatically are called professor or automatically are called historian or whatever. And I'm called great granddaughter. I'm like, but that's my relation to her. That's not my title. Right. So it's just kind of an interesting dynamic. <laughs> and then Martha, I think we um, have time for this question for you. So much has happened during the past year, um, but your book was already underway. So if you were adding another chapter, and I don't know, maybe you have a lot of what we've been living through included in the book, but if you had another chapter to add, uh, that included 2020, particularly these past six months, what would you write? Well, the first thing I, I want to confess, if I could, is, is what an inspiration uh, Michelle Duster um, is to me. And if you wonder whether that's true, I hope you'll read the introduction to Vanguard, where um, for the very first time, I try and write about my own grandmother and great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother and their struggles for voting rights. Um, uh, for me, this is... Um, this was important for me to try and um, find the right voice, the right tone, the right place from which to write out of family and then write a bigger history. Um, but one of the things I think I would have underscored, frankly, is that um, if I'd known so many of us were gonna be home, um, all bound up together with loved ones for a, a long, long periods of time, and many of us in very small spaces, um, I would have urged uh, more directly, uh, more of us, frankly, to think about family history as a beginning place for thinking about the history of women's politics and women's voting rights, that um, I was shy to do that. Michelle has been bold, um, but I do think that I discovered that I knew too little about the women in my family. Um, and I think today I would suggest everybody's Spring project, summer project, fall project, winter project should be to you know, interview the elders um, in your midst because it turns out that um, in many, many, many American families, if not all American families, um, women have stories about their voting rights, about their first votes, um, and they are meaningful and, and ones that we should collect and hold on to and preserve um, because we're not done. Um, as this pandemic has demonstrated with the struggles over voting rights in the United States, as Shelby versus Holder has made plain. Um, and I think capturing our family stories is, a, is something that I just dabble in a bit at the beginning of the book, um, but it's something I'm coming back to more and more because I realize um, that that is part of what fuels and informs who we are as women in politics today. So if you don't know your mother's story, your grandmother's story, your great-grandmother's story, um, I think it's time to find out. Okay, so that is our call to action for today. I just want to thank you both uh, for giving us an hour of your time. This has been a really inspiring and insightful conversation, and I am looking forward to the book I'm also looking forward to um, exploring more of the work that you're doing, Michelle, and seeing um, how I can be helpful. Thank you so much. Um, have a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>